The main purpose I'm here today is to emphasize that social media isn't as complex and as mystifying as it might be. There's really five core things that everybody needs to know and this will help them figure it out and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Emphasizing the idea to be more human instead of trying to be mechanical and automated with your social media presence. Well, uh, thank you very much. It's a uh... It's a great honor to be here, and uh, I know everybody says that, but I really mean it because uh, I've actually been to Wales, I think, seven or eight times now. I've been to Wales three out of the last four years, and I remember how much I love coming to Wales for the first time because my family is actually from Wales, and they settled in western Pennsylvania. And when I first got to Wales and saw the lovely green rolling hills, I thought, this looks exactly where I grew up in the United States. I can, I can see why the Welsh people loved uh, Pennsylvania and, and the people from Pennsylvania, they feel it's so home at, uh, in, uh, in Wales. So, um, uh, and when I gave my talk last year, at the end of the talk, I actually got emotional because I thought, when will I be back? Is, 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 this, is this the end? So I'm back. And uh, have me back again, <laughs> so I won't get emotional at the end of this talk. So uh, it's been great meeting uh, many of you, and there's definitely been a common theme in the conversations, and that is, oh, I, I'm still trying to figure out uh, social media. So that's what we're going to talk about today, but I want you to... Uh, lower your anxiety because I work with a lot of big companies around the world and uh, even the biggest companies, even the biggest brands, they're still trying to figure this out. And when you get right down to it, I don't think it's that difficult. Social media, there's a couple fundamental things about social media that we need to know. First of all, it's about cute babies. <laughs> it's about funny pictures of cats. It's about what I had for breakfast. And if you have a very, very effective strategy, it's baby cats talking about their breakfast. <laughs> and really, that's it. So I've got plenty of time for questions. <laughs> so what we're going to do today is we're going to walk through the five foundational strategies of social media. Uh, I keep getting uh, brought in to work with these companies and uh, all, the, all the young people in the company are saying, our, our uh, executives don't get it. We want to bring you in to explain this to them and you have one hour. So I started challenging myself. If I only had one hour, what would I say? And so I've been working on this for a couple of years, and I really think I've distilled it down to uh, its essence. So we're going to talk about five foundational strategies today. The first one is this idea that humans buy from humans. And to understand what I'm talking about here, you need to understand my grandfather. Uh, this is the family that, that, uh, that came from Wales, and uh, my grandfather was a plumber. He was a plumber in Pittsburgh for 50 years. His whole family was plumbers. He had 11 brothers that were plumbers. So my family was, you know, big into the sewage scene in, in Pittsburgh. And uh, my grandfather never took out an ad in his life. He never had a press release never had a Facebook page, and yet he was able to feed his family for 50 years. And if we look at some of the fundamental ways that people have wanted to buy and sell from each other, really since medieval times, since the first marketplaces were set up a thousand years ago, if you, if you hang with me for a few minutes, you'll see some parallels to what's happening today. Back in medieval times, or if you were dealing with my grandfather, people wanted to buy from people that they know. They wanted to work with people that they know. They don't, you're not going to buy 
from a logo. You're not going to buy from a jingle. So people bought work with my grandfather because they knew him from uh, his church or from a community group where they lived with him in the neighborhood. They trusted my grandfather because he did what he said. There was complete uh, transparency. Certainly that's been a theme of the conference today, bringing your whole self to your work, uh, being honest uh, and authentic in what you do. And if you weren't, he would experience this thing called immediacy, which means uh, people are going to tell you that you did something wrong. And they're not just going to tell you, they're going to tell everybody in the community, right? And you had to take care of these people if something went wrong, because the only thing you had to protect was your word of mouth reputation, right? You couldn't hide behind advertising. All you had was your word of mouth reputation. And this worked two ways. Not only would people buy from my grandfather because he had a good reputation, there were also people in the community who had a good reputation who could help him sell more stuff. And knowing who those people were was very, very key. So for example, back in medieval Europe, who was the big, the most important person in the village? Probably somebody with the church, right? Maybe a priest or a friar or something like that. So if you're selling soap, and everybody sees the priest using your soap, maybe not using your soap, <laughs> buying your soap. They see him buying your soap. See, I'm so embarrassed now. I've embarrassed myself in front of everybody in Wales. So the priest is buying your soap. And everybody sees him buying your soap. And they say, well, this must be pretty good soap. I trust the priest. So it worked both ways. And then there was this primal need for connection. Working, with, you know, connecting with people in our community, it was, it was fun. It was social. I got to visit Italy a few years and visit some of the small villages. In the middle of every village, there's this square. And as the sun goes down, people would come into the square, and they would trade, and they would buy things, and they would gossip. And that's really the heart of the way we like to buy and sell things. So the first way we connected with people in marketplaces, it was intimate, and it was connected. Everything changed around 1920, just 100 years ago. That's when we started to have radio. And when we had radio, we started broadcasting. We started <coughs> advertising. And it worked really, really well. If we wanted to reach a lot of people fast, advertising worked great. But we didn't know it at the time, but we had taken a one-way ticket away from our customers. We created this digital divide between us and the people that we're supposed to be uh, working with. Now, here's the bad news. If you're depending on advertising or traditional media to connect with the people that you're working with, working for or caring for in your jobs, this is really bad news. And uh, I gave a talk yesterday uh, to the Southwest uh, Media Group in uh, Swansea, and I asked if I could show this chart first. They said it was OK, because this is the truth. Advertising in newspapers is down to like 1950s levels. And you see, it, it's starting to come up a little bit in uh, the digital space. But people aren't reading newspapers anymore like they used to. What about television? I've probably c consumed more TV in the last two years than any time in the last 10. I never really consumed that much TV because I travel a lot. And I couldn't sit down in front of the TV every Thursday night at 8 o'clock. Then I discovered this thing called Netflix. Breaking Bad, hard to watch, hard not to watch. So you know, now I'm watching all these drug dealers and stuff. And, uh, you know, uh, then I start watching House of Cards, you know, more drug dealers and stuff. And I haven't seen one commercial. No, sports, you know, maybe the news. I haven't seen one commercial in two years. What about our websites? You might be thinking, well, we've got a website, so we're digital and we're safe. In the last two years, 60% of the Fortune 500 companies have had fewer 
visitors to their website. Where are they going? I think you know the answer to this. They're spending more and more time on the social web, especially millennials. Do we have any millennials in here? Are they, are they still on their way? We have a, a couple. By 2020, six years from now, 50% of our workforce are going to be millennials. 50% of our customers are going to be millennials. Where do they get their information? The social web. To many people, young people today, Facebook is the internet. They don't go anywhere else. 50% of the millennials say, this Facebook is my number one source for news. Search on Facebook has tripled in the last two years. They're using Facebook like Google. This is how they're finding people and services and businesses that they need to connect with. Now here is the amazing thing. Our expectations as consumers are still the same. So I talk to a lot of business people and they just say, I'm so confused. This changes everything. I hate social media. I love advertising because I could just give money to somebody and wait for something to happen. Now these people, they're talking back. They want to talk back. This is freaking me out. It's like the deer have guns. Make this go away. I just have two years till retirement. Help me through this, Schaefer. But once they realize that this is the way that people have always wanted to connect with us, it hasn't changed. We just had an interruption for 100 years. We forgot about this, all right? People still want to connect with real people. They want to know you. They want to know who's behind this organization. Can we trust them? And if we don't, you're going to hear about it. New research. Millennials are the least trusting generation ever. And they can sniff out fakes in 140 characters on Twitter. <laughs> All right? This is a big challenge. You can't fool these people. You can't try to fool these people. You have to be honest because they're not just going to tell six people in their neighborhood. They're going to tell their 6,000 followers on Twitter. We had this experience over in America. All our airlines are terrible in America. But there's one that's particularly bad. And uh, United Airlines. So this musician had a very expensive guitar. He's looking out the window, and he sees the guitar being thrown into the baggage thing, right? Sure enough, when he gets to his destination, the guitar's broken. So he calls United Airlines. He said, will you replace my <coughs> guitar? They said, no. So he wrote a song called United Breaks Guitars. He put it on YouTube. Two million views later, they replaced his guitar. <laughs> That's called immediacy, all right? And uh, what we're seeing now is that uh, for many people, especially young people, the first place they go to complain is the social web. And they expect an answer in an hour. 24 hours a day. Think about what that means to our organizations. All right? So we're, we, this, we've had so many great uh, workshops and discussions about leadership and transparency. Well, now the masses kind of want this all the time. They want this 24 hours a day. They want transparency. They want authenticity. They want honesty. And they want it on Twitter. They want it on YouTube. And you, you need to be tuning into this because, again, you've got to be concerned about your word of mouth reputation, all right? It can be tarnished like this. And we see it in the news all the time. And then finally, there's still this primal need for communion, for connection, for fun. People love to talk about what they're doing. They love to talk about what movie they're seeing and who they're working with and what they're buying. So it's almost like social media is uh, kind of like that square in the medieval town all over again. So when you start thinking about uh, these ideas, you think, well, you know, this isn't so hard to understand. And we have to start thinking about this is what people want from us. 
how are we going to start working like this in our organization? How are we going to start connecting like this in our organization? So that's number one. Humans buy from humans. Now, to, to transition into number two, I want to tell you a little story about me and a lesson I learned. This is a story about some of my dead bushes. These are not my dead bushes, but when I Googled dead bushes, this was the most dramatic picture I could find because it expresses my sentiment about my bushes. So we have this uh, do-it-yourself chain uh, in America called Home Depot. You have something similar here. What do you, it's called B and B and Q. B &Q. Okay, so it's like that. So uh, I have, I had a, an older house, and over the last two years, I've spent $20,000 with Home Depot fixing up this house, getting it ready to sell. So I was doing new landscaping, and I planted these bushes, and half the bushes died. So I took a picture of the bushes, I took the receipt back to Home Depot, and I said, I would like some new bushes. And the clerk looked at my picture and he said, you need the bushes. And I said, well, I didn't want to uh, dig up these root balls. I didn't want to put them in my car. And he said, these could be anybody's bushes. You could have taken a picture of your neighbor's dead bushes. And this is like $18 worth of bushes. And here's the reaction that I had. But you're my friend. We've been through so much together. <laughs> and now you don't believe me. Don't you remember how well the kitchen turned out? <laughs> and, and I caught myself. And I thought, this is a billion dollar company, multi-billion dollar company based in Atlanta. They don't know who I am, but you know what? I wanted them to know who I am because we create emotional connections with organizations that we work with just like we create connections with our friends. So to me, Home Depot isn't just a brand, it's a friend, it's a buddy. And if you think about why are people working with you, in many cases, it's because they have to. But in other cases, when they have uh, choices, why do they love you? Aren't they also forming an emotional connection to you? And don't we want to encourage that because we want people to trust us. We want people to come and work for us. And so this is exactly what social media is good at. Social media creates these small little connections that lead to awareness and eventually loyalty, okay? So I started thinking about this when I saw this picture down at the bottom here. This fellow, at least I assume it's a fellow by the shape of his foot. Uh, I could be wrong. He, uh, tattooed a Nike logo on his foot. And I thought, what would make a person do this? What would make a person decide one day, by golly, I am running down to the tattoo parlor and I'm getting a company logo emblazoned on my body forever? Isn't this like the ultimate sign of trust? the ultimate sign of loyalty. This person loves this logo so much, it's on his foot forever. What would make someone dress up like your organization or decorate their nails or you know, be some kind of fanatic? The more I thought about this, I thought it's like being invited to a birthday party. And I know what you're thinking, isn't this cute? I'll bet that's Mark's birthday party. No, it's not. But if this were my birthday party, this would be me right here, just ignoring the camera and focusing on the cake. <laughs> so do you remember your first day of school? I had my, you don't remember your first, was that like one of your blackout periods or something? <laughs> remember you talked, no, okay. 
So uh, I had my new white tennis shoes on, my Disney lunchbox, you know, and I'm trying to be brave, but it's scary. And it's noisy and it's big and, you know, it's colorful and I know most of the letters. And then someone comes up and starts talking to me. His name was Jim, Jim Buckley. Jim starts talking to me. I thought, ah, someone's talking to me. It's not going to be so bad. And then I had someone to look for in the playground. We played together. And then I was invited to his house to play. And he came to my house to play. And then I went to a sleepover. And after weeks and months, I got invited to the birthday party. I was somebody. This was like the ultimate sign of trust. Now, this is also what we typically do with our businesses and our organizations. This is what marketing is all about. We want to create interactions with our consumers over time that, that lead to stronger and stronger forms of engagement. All right? This is a, a sales funnel. We want to we find people. We want to create awareness. And then we want to connect with them. And hopefully, they'll buy something. And then at the very, very top, it's it's loyalty, right? This is what we're trying to do. If we don't have people using our services, if we don't have people buying our products, we're going to go away. So this is what we're trying to do. So at the very bottom of this, there's no better way to figure out what's going on than social media and to find the people who need us and who love us and who are talking about us. We're going to see some examples of this uh, in a minute. A lot of people will say the first thing you need to do to get involved in social media is not necessarily publish a Facebook page, but just to listen. Find out what's going on out there in, in some of these platforms. Now, another thing I want you to think about, uh, how many are, are doing something in social media today in your organizations? Maybe a third, maybe close to a half? Whenever I come into a lot of these organizations, they'll say, well, here are our metrics. The number of friends we have on Facebook, the number of likes we have, the number of followers, the number of comments. And so what I'm thinking is, if you're with me here, that this is an opportunity to build relationships, to reconnect like back on this medieval level that people want anyway, how would you feel if you had a friend who said, uh, you're only coming to my house. That's my metric. So if you want to build connections and relationships, should one of your metrics be, how many likes are we giving away? How many, how many people are we becoming friends with? How many people, how, much, uh, how many times are we visiting other people's uh, blogs or Facebook pages? So the... The first uh, mention today, we're going to talk about this a lot. This is, uh, represents content. Content is the catalyst in social media that drives people up this curve. And this is what's so cool. We can provide these little provocations, all right? We might not be able to visit with our customers every day, every week, or even every month. But we can provide this little drip, drip, drip on, on the social web to say, hey, we're here. We're thinking about you. We are concerned about you. We have something great for you. We want to help you. And this, these provocations are in the form of content. It could be lots of different things. It could be what? A blog post, a video, a podcast. It could be a recipe. It could just be a post on Twitter or something like that. So, Social media provides this consistent drip, 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 these provocations that help us connect with people. And then over time, you get invited to the birthday party. What does that mean to you? Maybe they sign up for something. Maybe they download something. Maybe they visit your website or a blog. Or maybe they start following you on Facebook. But the level of engagement keeps going up. And eventually, I'm not going to promise you that they're going to tattoo your logo, you know, maybe that cool red dragon that you all have here. Uh, I'd probably tattoo that. Uh, but, I, you know, I can't promise that they're going to tattoo a logo, but 
there are also ways to use social media to keep this going and, and reward the people and to celebrate the people who are using your services, right? So you can involve them. And we're going to see some examples of that too. Now, this is an interesting chart. So it's, it's about a year old, but it shows that in the last two years that uh, the number of people that are following brands and organizations on social media have doubled. And I think that's really interesting because I don't think human nature has changed where people are suddenly uh, more psychologically fit to begin following brands. I think what this shows is that organizations are starting to get it. This is earned media. This isn't like advertising where you can pay to get people involved. You have to earn this. You have to create these provocations, this content that's really cool, that's really helpful, really useful to make this happen. I think this shows that companies are starting to get it. They're starting to figure out we just can't use social media like advertising. Uh, it's got to be uh, different. The other thing that was interesting about this is this, the, the, it showed why. Why are you following? Number one, to learn more about what's going on. But number two, over 50% of the people said, I'm following this organization because I love them. Because I feel like they're my friend, right? It kind of goes back to the whole, why are they there? Why do they love you? And if they create this emotional attachment, that's why they're here. It blew me away. Over half the people, they're not looking for a deal. They just love this company and they want to follow them. I know what you're thinking right now. Is it time for a break? No. Or you might be thinking, how can this possibly get any more exciting? Well, it is going to get more exciting because now we're going to turn to number three, the information ecosystem. Who can tell me what this is? Just shout it out. Holy cow. How many people said toner cartridge? That is crazy. Because usually when I teach a class or I give a talk, one, everybody will say printer cartridge. And like maybe one person will say toner cartridge. Half the audience said toner cartridge. I have never been in a place that knows their office supplies so well. I don't even know what to think about this. You guys must be really watching your budget. <laughs> Indeed, this is a toner cartridge. And uh, the story to kind of show this point is about, I've got this friend, he's a young guy named Nathan, and he, when he graduated from college, he got a job working for this company that manages the contracts of, uh, you know, printers and uh, fax machines, whatever you might have in your office. So he was so excited about this, but he kind of had a disappointment. On his first day in the office, his boss said, we are so glad you're here. As our marketing manager, you're here to sell more stuff to more people more often for more money, but you have no budget. Everybody's nodding their head. <laughs> and you might be thinking, oh my gosh, how can this get any worse? It gets worse because people hate your product. People hate printers. They always fail at the wrong time. Now we talked about this idea of using social media to listen and connect. And what you might find, I encourage you to explore this idea. Some people think Twitter is the, the best source of customer information in the history of the human race. And here's why. If you Google something or Bing something, anybody use Bing? That's what I thought. Oh, there is one, okay. So, all right, so I won't make fun of Bing. Uh, it kind of just did. Uh, so if you Google something or you Bing something, you're going to get links and websites and videos. When you put a search on Twitter, you get conversations about you happening right now. All right, so there's lots and lots of ways we can use this 
to start to tune in to, to what's going on in our communities. Well, if you ever are really bored and you need a laugh, go on to Twitter and type in printer hate. Because what do people love to do on Twitter more than anything? Bitch. That's a universal word, right? OK. I always have to be culturally sensitive. So for example, printer hate. Uh, this guy says, uh, I hate my printer, and my printer hates me. It's got personal now. <laughs> so it does get worse, because not only does he have no money, people hate his product, and he realized it doesn't matter that I don't have a budget. If I had all the money in the world, I couldn't change these people's minds anyway. So what's he going to do? Well, in a ninja-like move, you know, martial arts, they say, go with the energy, don't fight the energy. He said, look, the emotion that people uh, have on printers is hate. Let's just go with it. Let's celebrate this. He created a contest called Destroy Your Printer. And he promoted this idea, and he wanted to have people submit videos of the most creative ways to destroy your printer. Here is the winner from year one. This is a printer being blown up by dynamite. <laughs> now, one of the lessons here is that this winning video was created on a smartphone. So the barriers, that, think about what I said about the importance of content. The barriers to creating content today are almost zero. All right? So there's lots of ways we can involve people. The pressure's not just on us. There's lots of stories out there about who we're serving and what we're doing. How do we find those stories? How do we, uh, I'm just distracted by the photographer here. D should I vogue? <laughs> I can. <laughs> no, because that's the one you'll publish. <laughs> Don't, stop. <laughs> OK. All right, I'm back. I'm back. So uh, literally, this guy did this on a smartphone. He's walking through the woods. And he's narrating it on his phone. He said, we're approaching the target. And he turns it around, and the printer's sitting on a rock, and the birds are singing, and the crickets are chirping. It's all very bucolic. And then all of a sudden, the thing blows up. And uh, this is the winner from this year. <laughs> I think this is self-explanatory. <laughs> so this thing is getting traction. Now, so let's dissect this and, and, and see what we can learn from this. He had no money. So he promoted this on his blog, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Now, let's not kid ourselves here that this stuff takes time, OK? But out of pocket, he, d he didn't have to spend any money to do this part of it. And let's also not kid ourselves that it takes some period of time to establish this, OK? So if you're working for a supervisor that says, we need to have a Facebook page, and they think this is going to solve all our problems overnight, that is not going to happen. It takes time to build an audience, to build that emotional connection. Now, even before he started working for this company, he had been building his connections and his audience on social media for a couple of years. And one of the people he built a connection with was me. He would come onto my blog. He would leave comments. If he liked what I did, he would tweet it. And one day, he sent me a tweet, and he said, hey, Check out this link. Check out this contest. And it was a link to all these things being blown up, being thrown off buildings. They covered one with meat, and they put dogs on it. <laughs> and it was, it was hilarious. It was creative. So I wrote a blog post about it. And then other people wrote blog posts about it. And the thing started getting viral. He got mentioned in the New York Times. He was even featured in Recycling Today. If you're in the printer cartridge business, this is bigger than the New York Times. 
He was the number one story on recycling today for three consecutive weeks. He got 100 new sales leads in just eight weeks, but most important of all, he actually got, oh, oh shoot, I don't have that slide, shoot, okay. Well, this was a special presentation for you that I should have had that slide in there. But uh, there was a, a, a slide that I thought I had in there of a lady who actually was outside his sales territory, but loved this contest so much, she said, I wanna buy a printer from the Twitter guy. He said, okay, I'll drive it to you. And she wrote a blog post about this and took a picture with this guy. So uh, let's look at what was happening here. Uh, how much traffic do you think this drove to his website? Any brave people want to? Where's the millennial? Come on, millennial. Who is there? Was you? You were the millennial. You, she was crawling under the table. That's awesome. How how much per, how much traffic did this drive to the website? A percentage. Oh, oh my goodness! You are so smart. <laughs> That is exactly right. She said it didn't really bring any. That's exactly the right answer. I thought I was going to trick her. Because most people say, a thousand percent. The answer is really zero. Or almost zero. Why? It was so successful. Because you didn't have to go to the website at all. You could participate in this contest. You could upload these things to YouTube. You could see them on YouTube. He promoted it on his blog, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, other people's blogs, online magazines. You could learn about this whole thing and never visit the website. But who did visit the website? The people that wanted to buy something. So this is a different way to think. Uh, one of the things that distinguishes me, it's one of my points of differentiation, is I'm old. I'm older than most, than many bloggers. And uh, that probably surprises you. But, uh, so I can remember before we had websites, we had brochures, right? And so we took these brochures over to some IT person and we said, make it into a website. You can use the same pictures, you can use the same copy, just do it. We're falling behind. So the website was really little more than a brochure. It was a destination, right? But today, as we've already learned, less and less people are, are visiting our websites. They're spending more time out here on the social web. So what we need to do is populate these areas. And I'm not saying you have to be exactly in these areas. I'm just using this as an example. But we need to go out there and help people where they are. This is where they're spending their time today. We have to turn these platforms into, into our own brand stands. But what we also want to do is drive them back to the middle because the website is still important. The website is still where the business gets done. So while we're out here being human and connecting with people and building relationships, we still have to be in business. We still have to get people to come to our webinar or come to our class or upload something, download something, or buy something. And the call to action takes place on the website. So the website is still important, but it plays a diff different role than it did before. It's not necessarily the destination anymore. It's almost like a train station where it's shuttling people to get the right information that they need about your organization, okay? Now, let's go into number four. And uh, this might be the most important one that we talk about today because this is the number one thing that people miss. This is the number one thing that uh, I, uh, the, the number one problem I see in organizations that, are, that just can't get going that are, are, are failing in this area. And as I said, for the last 100 years, we've been conditioned to sell and to advertise. But people on social media, they're not going there for you. People are going on to Facebook to play games, right? They're going there to play Farmville. 
uh, they're going there to see pictures of cats and uh, One Direction or, you know, whatever some people are. That's what I heard. Some people are giggling. It's true. There are at least five people who are going to see One Direction. I know that. I, there's research on it. All right. So, so it's, it's really difficult because what we've been accustomed to doing for the last 100 years is advertising, but people are sick of it. They're running away. They're tired of being advertised to. They're tired of being sold to. They don't want to see a picture of you giving a check to the mayor for a new sewage system or something. They want to play Farmville. They're going there to relax. So they're not going to spend a second with your ad, but they will spend hours with people and organizations who will help them, who help them save money, make money, learn something, be healthier, be happier, have more fun, be more entertained. This is what people are looking for. This is what they need most of all right now. They don't trust advertising. And remember, the millennials are even worse. So this is the new mindset. Behind every successful social media story that you hear, behind every case study, you're going to find these three things. Not one, not two, all three. And there's that word again, content. Content is the catalyst that makes all this happen, okay? So you need to be thinking about, if you're starting something for your organization, Who's going to do this stuff? And what I find is a lot of organizations already have tons of stuff. They're just not thinking this way. They've got it you know, on a computer, on a website, in a brochure, on paper, in a speech, on a video. But they're, they're not leveraging it in a digital way. Now, the good news is most organizations are starting to get this. They're saying, OK, we know we need to have a Facebook page. We know we need to have a blog but they're missing number two. Because all this content that we're putting out there, it doesn't make any difference unless it moves, unless people connect with it, unless people read it and share it and engage with it and comment on it. And it's really hard to get people to do that. People are generally lazy. You know, they don't want to share. They don't want to push that button. So you've got to go out and find these people and make these connections continuously and mindfully. Then the last part is this authentic helpfulness. As I said, people don't want to be sold to, but that's all we want to do. I was in, you know, I worked for big companies for 27 years. I was in sales, I was in marketing, and I know what it's like to have these quarterly goals. You know, you know, you got to hit the numbers, hit the numbers, right? And it's difficult to say, okay, I'm not selling anymore, I'm helping. That's hard, isn't it? But that's what we have to do. We have to completely change the way that we're approaching this because if you go out there and you're, and you're trying to sell people stuff on social media, they're going to click you right off. But if you approach them in a helpful way, things will begin to happen. So I want to give you an example of how this happened in real life. This is a little case study, uh, and it involves me. And that is an American football helmet, the Pittsburgh Steelers. Hey, 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 my new best friend. He knows the Steelers. So the Steelers are uh, a very popular team, and because I kind of grew up in Pittsburgh. They're my hometown team. So I was working one night, and I had Twitter on, and I said, I'm watching the Steeler game on television. I hope they win. This young lady tweeted back, I'm in Pittsburgh. I'm watching the game, too. I hope they win. I had no idea who this person was. Never heard of her before in my life. But she knew who I was. She selected me. She was choosing her audience. She was a... MBA student, uh, she's getting a master's degree in marketing, and she saw my bio. This guy is a marketing educator, and a blogger, and an author, and a consultant. This is what I want to do someday. 
I want to find a way to connect with him. All right? Now, the other reason I love this idea, this, this story, is I can remember when it started. And isn't this interesting? We're gonna, this is going to turn into this big uh, relationship. This didn't start with, we weren't talking about business. We weren't talking about blogs. We weren't talking about a PhD thesis or a white paper or a seminar. We're talking about sports. That's how people connected, right? That's how we've always connected, right? And that's how this started too. So after, uh, I didn't hear anything more from Michelle. And a week uh, later, I got an email from her. She said, I've learned so much from your blog. Is there any way you could take a look at my blog and give me some feedback? I said, sure. I like helping young people. I like helping entrepreneurs. And when I saw her blog, I, I was amazed because she wasn't just blogging. She was creating these videos that were unlike anything I've ever seen. She was like jumping all over the place and things were falling from the sky. She was edgy and quirky and funny and hip. All the things I'm We set another record today. <laughs> self-deprecating humor works a lot better if it comes from the person who's trying to be <laughs> self-deprecating. Oh well, so much for friendly whales. <laughs> so I had this idea. Could she make a video for me and my business? Maybe by association, people would think I'm cool and hip too. So she said, I'd love to do this video for you, but I'd never take money from you. But I really need a new video camera. I'm a poor college student. You know, I, I got this crappy old camera. I need an HD camera. I said, how much are we talking about? She said, $200. I said, done. She got a camera. She made a video. Went viral. Everybody loved it. It was great. Michelle was getting famous because everybody wanted to know who made this video. I said uh, Michelle lived in Pittsburgh, and she was at a networking meeting. While she was there, some entrepreneurs said, you know, we're, we're having trouble starting our business. We need marketing help. Do you know anybody that can help us? She said, you know, I know this guy, Mark Schaefer. You got to give him a call. So they gave me a call, and I wasn't really that interested. But I knew a guy that I, there was a marketing professor I had surrounded myself with. He was one of my heroes. And one of the things I knew about him is he had six kids and his business was failing. I said, you know what? I don't need this customer, but I know someone who does. So I called him up. He talked to these people. He got a new customer out of it. Michelle moved to Paris. She took a new job over there when she graduated. And when she got there, her company said, we are growing so fast. We need a new marketing director in North America. Do you know anybody that can help us? She said, there's this guy named Mark Schaefer. You ought to give him a call. So they called me up, and you know, I was busy. I was enjoying what I was doing. I said, you know, I don't really need this job. But I know a guy with six kids that really needs a job. Called him up. They flew him to France, interviewed him, gave him the job. Now, I had never met Michelle at this point. My wife and I went on vacation to Europe. I said, let's stop by Paris and say hello to Michelle. Michelle says, it's amazing. The very day you're going to be here, I'm hosting a party for bloggers from all around the world under a bridge next to Notre Dame with French food and champagne. Would you like to come? <laughs> My answer was, yes. duh. Yes. So I got to go to this party. I met this amazing guy named Gregory Puy. He's the number one marketing blogger in France. No one's heard of him outside of France. Guess why? He blogs in French. This was something I learned while I was there. They have a different word for everything. Is <laughs> Being from America, I had no idea something like this existed. <laughs> so I said, Gregory, if you translated your blogs into English, we could put them on my blog. You'd get a whole new audience. I'd get content nobody has seen before. So we've been working together for three years. In fact, he's going to have a, a post on my blog uh, next week. Michelle left her company eventually. She went to work for Uber. You know Uber? You know, you can get the limos. 
So uh, last year I was in London for uh, 10 days. This was another thing. I'm sure this was unusual. It rained the whole time I was there. <laughs> and uh, so Michelle said, I have a special app for you on Uber. You've been so nice to me. We've helped each other for years now. I have a special app. You get all your limos for free. Whole time you're in London, okay? And so this story also became uh, the, f the first story in my first book. And uh, I've now done, I'm not, now I've got a new edition coming up, and I'm always keeping this story in there because people just, just love this story. Now, one thing I want to talk to you about is I want you to think about all of the benefits that came out of this little case study. All right? I got a video. Michelle got awareness. Uh, she got a new video camera. I got to go to a party. <laughs> I got free limousine service. I got a, someone helping me on my blog. I'm getting great content. I'm giving Gregory all this new uh, exposure. We're helping each other. So all these things. Now, I want you to think about something. All these little things in this five-minute story, how many of these could we put on a spreadsheet? Almost none. And I want you, I, if you take anything away, I, this is one of the things I want you to take away with, because a lot of the companies I go to, they said, they said well, how do you measure this stuff? What's the ROI of social media? What's the ROI of Twitter? And I'm not saying you shouldn't measure. Absolutely you should measure. You should connect everything we do, every penny we spend on how it's helping our, our customers and our clients. But I also want to challenge you to open up your eyes and your minds to quantitative benefits, qualitative benefits, not just quantitative, all right? Quantitative are things we can count, things we can measure, like money. But a lot of the benefits on social media come in terms of relationships and helping and things that are hard to quantify. And if we don't grasp that, we're going to fail. This is why small organizations have an advantage here over big organizations. Because small organizations, like my companies, I can see this happening. I can see these benefits every single day. But in big companies, there's three layers between the people who are doing this and the people who have the strategy and the budget. And at some point, the person with the strategy and the budget is, is going to say, oh, I love all this stuff that we're doing on Twitter and the Facebox. You're doing such a good job. Uh, but what's the ROI? Where's my pie chart? And that's when it all starts to fall apart. And I also wanted to mention, we had a lovely discussion before the talk here today, that the reason I'm here today is because of, tw of one tweet. All right? I almost thought about not doing this story and doing, doing another one. But... Uh, a few years ago, there was a fellow in Wales started following me on Twitter, started following my blog, liked my blog, bought my book, wrote me an email and said, your book changed my life. And he told me all these things that happened once he started following these ideas. And he started meeting all these people. And he, he has an autistic child. He found specialized help for an autistic child uh, in Cardiff, he didn't even know existed all through Twitter. And every week, he set, kept sending me new things. This is what happened next. This is what happened next. I said, why don't you bring all these wonderful people together in Wales and have a social media conference? He said, I'll do it. He said, I can't do this without you. I said, tell you what, if you can find a way to get me over there, I'll waive my fees. I'll come and speak for free. And I did it. And where's Chris Bolt? Chris Bolt was there. He was at the conference. He saw me speak. And he came back to the academy and said, we need to bring Mark Schaefer to this thing. All right? That's how this stuff works. And I could tell stories like this all day long. And people say, you are so lucky. But was this luck? The answer to that is no. These three things, this social media mindset, these three things were in place, okay? 
Content is the catalyst, right? This never would have happened without Michelle taking the initiative to tweet me back about the football game, right? What connected me to Michelle? Her videos. What connected her to me? The blog. What connected me to Gregory? His writing. And the champagne. But content is the catalyst that made this thing happen. This was not random. Michelle chose me. I chose the guy with the six kids to be my friend. The guy in Wales that invited me over to give the conference, he chose me because of my content. He, all these people were picking their audience in a mindful way, in a purposeful way. It wasn't random and it was continuous. And this is Michelle and, and I, the first time we met under the bridge. And I ask people, do you think that uh, I was thinking, I can't wait till I sell Michelle something? Do you think Gregory was ever thinking, I can't wait until Mark is my customer? And that's not the way it works. We just said, we're going to help each other. Just help, help, help. Not sell, sell, sell. But the benefits are undeniable, and the benefits are powerful. <laughs> I know what you're thinking now. My coffee is wearing off, and I really need a bathroom right now. Or you might be thinking, how can this possibly get any more interesting? It is going to get more interesting. And I'm using this slide for a special purpose. This is my secret weapon, because I know right now it's hot in here. You're at the end of day three, you're getting tired, and I need to do everything I can to keep you with me. So I've brought out the Cheeto dog. <laughs> when a dog dresses like this, he goes incognito. <laughs> and I know that's a terrible joke, and I fully own that, I'm unaccountable for that. But I'm doing anything I can right now to keep you here, to keep you present, because we've got one more to go. And this is this idea that content is so important and content is so centered to this that it deserves a space all of its own. Content is not just a catalyst. Content is a legitimate source of power on the web. And it's really important for you to understand this because this is new. This couldn't have happened just a few years ago. It's not just writing a blog post. Remember what I said. It has to be content that moves. And for this to happen, to, for this to be an opportunity for you and your organizations, two things had to happen. Number one, we needed to have widespread access to high-speed internet, okay? Everybody started, needs, needed to start getting on the internet. The other thing is, we needed to have access to free, easy to use publishing tools like Facebook and Twitter and blogging. And it is getting hot in here. Are you guys getting hot? It's getting warm. Thank you for hanging in there. I gave a talk two weeks ago at a university and I was, I, there was a young guy in the front row and he's tweeting everything I said. And uh, I said, well, the most important thing to understand about social media, and I was getting so hot, I was burning up. So I took off my jacket and I said, see, I'm warming up. It's always, it's always good, good news when the closers start coming off. So he tweets, Mr. Schaefer says, the most important thing about social media is it's always good when the clothes come off. <laughs> it's all about your brand. All right? So... I want to give you an example of how this, is, how this is working today, how this is really, really happening. And to do this, I want to tell a story about this guy named Robert. This is a true story. Uh, he was born to a very poor family in New Jersey. And in the late 80s, he moved to the Silicon Valley. Can you imagine how exciting that would be, how crazy it would be to be in Silicon Valley in the late 80s, early 90s? He wanted to work for one of these companies, but no one would hire him because he didn't have a college degree. He wasn't a business type. He was very shy. He was really 
kind of nerdy. He didn't have any money. He couldn't uh, invest in a company. He couldn't start a company. So when he dropped out of college, he went to work for a camera store. He was a clerk in a camera store. This is how this guy started his career. In the early 90s, he discovered blogging. He was one of the pioneers, really. And blogging was a way that he could connect to the, the businesses and the ideas and the people in Silicon Valley. He didn't have to wait to be picked. He picked himself. He said, I'm going to do this. This is what I love. So he started blogging once a month, then once a week, then once a day, sometimes multiple times a day. And this amazing thing happened. People started reading this kid's blog. Hundreds, thousands, eventually tens of thousands of people are reading what he's writing every single day. Businesses start to pick up on this. They said, this guy's a player. We got to invite him to our product launches. We don't know who he is or where he came from, but he's starting to have an impact on our business. They started sending him stuff, gadgets, hardware, software, phones, computers, because they wanted to show up in this guy's blog. He was creating this power and influence through the, the words on his keyboard. There was one famous example he quadrupled the traffic to a startup company's website in one day with one mention in a blog post. And that was over a, a Christmas weekend, no less. Now let's think about where is his power coming from? It's not the traditional ways. It doesn't matter where he went to school anymore. Nobody really cares. This is what he could do almost better than anybody. He could create content that moved, that moved through his system and beyond. This is a true story. It's a guy named Robert Scoble. He's still the most powerful tech blogger in the world. When Google came out with Google Glass, he was the first one to get a pair. And this is really important to understand because there's not just an opportunity for you and your brands, but there are also powerful people out there advocates for you who are out there moving content. Do you know who they are? Who's your Robert Scoble for your business, for your community? These are the people, remember we talked about the priest, right? Being the powerful person. It was easy to know who those people were if we only lived in a little village. It's harder today, but now we have tools to find out who are these people moving content? Because this is a very key idea. Content that moves through a network is a legitimate source of influence. And it's it was only available now. It's only available uh, today. So it's really important to uh, understand this. And I'd like you to think about what opportunity uh, do you have to create your own return on influence in this historic opportunity that we have? We're going to open it up to questions. And I want to lead, leave you with one last uh, idea. And I think this reflects a lot of the things that we've been talking about uh, in the uh, academy over the last few days. We, we've talked a lot about today how technology and these ideas and marketing people are all intersecting. And I had an opportunity a few years ago as I was uh, doing research for a book to uh, interview a guy named Dr. Robert Cialdini. He's the most famous author and, and academic on power and influence in the world. At the end of the interview, I said, Dr. Cialdini, in this crazy world where there's so much competition and so much content, how do you stand out? How do you stand out in this world? And he said something so simple and so profound. And I think about it every day, and every day I think, he is more and more right. This is what he said. Be more human. Be more human. This is the killer app. This trumps everything because when we're human, this is the way people have always wanted to connect with us. They want to know you. And if you just keep thinking in my daily work, in the way I work with the people in our community, 
How can I show up more caring, more authentic, more human? That is what's going to win because that is going to create awareness for you and your organization. Awareness is going to lead to engagement. Engagement leads to loyalty and loyalty trumps everything. So I mean, thank you very much. We, I think we still have time for questions.